Hello everyone and welcome to our um, mid-July Lunch and Learn. I'm really happy to have Jean Kelly, our Policy and Legislation Chair, on today. Um, Jean is going to be doing a longer presentation of uh, his very compressed uh, policy presentation that he did at the annual meeting and so th there was not a lot of time so he's going to be expanding on that. So uh, Jean, take it away. Yes, thanks a lot Valerie. Um, so as, as Valerie mentioned, uh, this is adapted from the presentation I gave during the annual membership meeting. Uh, we had to race through it so I can take things at a little more leisurely pace, go into a little more detail. And I also want to expand a bit more on what our priorities will be going forward. But ultimately, I, I really do appreciate this chance to share with the members what it is that the policy committee has been doing on your behalf, on behalf of native plants and native plant communities. I, I do have listed here uh, the names of the members of my committee. It's a good group. Uh, we have some pretty spirited discussions. And I also always like to acknowledge that we do have a paid lobbyist, Sue Mullins. She participates in all those meetings. Uh, usually she is helping to guide those as she gives us updates on, on what she's been doing, uh, typically in Tallahassee on behalf of the Native Plant Society. So the 2022 legislative session, as I, I've entitled this, the good, the bad, and the exceedingly ugly, I'll spend a little bit of time on each of those categories. Uh, and contrary to the uh, scene there in the lower right corner, it's, it's not all hugs and kisses in the legislature. Uh, in fact, uh, quite the opposite. There's a lot of antagonism uh, in, in terms of those on different sides of the aisle. It's a a very uh, uh, Republican dominated legislature and state government, if you will, and uh, not pointing fingers. But uh, anyway, let, let's start by talking about the good, a good place to start. And you know, certainly uh, at the top of the list of good things was a bill, Senate Bill 364 that extended the, the period of time that we have in order to sell license plate vouchers. You might recall that a couple sessions ago, a couple of years ago, uh, the legislature passed a bill that authorized the creation of uh, a number of new specialty license plates. One of them was for the Florida Native Plant Society. Uh, it could be a really important uh, source of funding for the organization if we can manage to sell the 3,000 vouchers that are required uh, for a license plate to actually be able to go into production so that you can receive one in the mail or at your uh, uh, local tax collector's office and put it on your vehicle. Um, and the reason they, they extended the, the two years to give us an additional two years was because the pandemic came along and, and pretty much every organization uh, that was trying to sell these vouchers just ran into a, a wall. As, as we all know, things kind of came to a standstill. So we have until October 2024. Uh, there is another little Side aside to this bill that I, I would like to bring up, coincidentally, uh, my chapter, my local chapter, the Hernando County chapter, uh, played a role because the, the House committee that was really the roadblock for this bill going anywhere uh, is chaired by our representative. Uh, he's, he's running for a different office in this upcoming election, but the bill was stalled there. Uh, there was no indication, even late in the session, that anything was going to happen. We were approaching the deadline where bills that had gone anywhere would, would just die and fail for that session. 
And uh, we, as his constituents, started applying a little pressure. We wanted him to know that he had constituents who actually cared about this bill. And lo and behold, he did move it. And once he did that, it it pretty much sailed through the legislature and became law. So we have an additional two years. And if we can sell those 3,000 vouchers, uh, that's a minimum of $75,000 a, a year of funding uh, going directly to the Florida Native Plant Society every year. Every every plate above 3,000 just increases uh, that funding amount that would come to us. So that was a good bill. Another good thing that happened uh, was a bad bill in this in this case, uh, a seagrass mitigation bank bill that would have allowed uh, seagrass uh, mitigation banks to be established and made it easier to destroy seagrasses. Uh, I say here that it's unproven uh, seagrass mitigation. Uh, in fact, it's it's pretty abysmal and pretty much usually fails. So in this case, that bill failed to pass. Uh, we and most of our fellow conservation organizations were really horrified by this bill. We were all speaking with one voice. And uh, given that level of opposition, it, it basically just failed to pass. So end of story on that one until probably next year, the next legislative session. We won't be surprised if it comes back in some shape or form. Another good thing that happened was House Bill 741, the net metering bill, was vetoed. So this was a pretty terrible bill that did pass, but the governor vetoed it. And if you weren't familiar with it, it, it really would have uh, been a major hindrance to the, the rooftop solar industry. Not surprisingly, this bill was actually written by and for Florida Power and Light. In fact, it was almost comical. One of the first uh, legislative committee meetings that reviewed this bill at the very beginning of the session, the sponsor of the bill was there at the podium and questions were being posed and she was unable to answer any of them. So she referred to a Florida Power and Light lobbyist behind her who came up and was able to explain what the bill would do. But thankfully, that was vetoed. Uh, again, a lot of environmental organizations speaking with one voice, asking uh, the governor to veto that bill, which he did. Some more on the in the good column. You might recall a couple of years ago, a bill was passed that preempted uh, local government tree protection ordinances. And uh, what this bill did, Senate Bill 518, was it, it basically limited that preemption. It undid the worst of what that bill had done a couple of years ago. There, there is still a preemption uh, on single family residential lots, but it does prohibit trees from being removed there unless they are determined to present an unacceptable risk to health and property. Uh, there was a bill that uh, requires, well, it doesn't require septic tank inspections, but it allows them that allows a, a septic tank owner to have it inspected and, and authorizes DEP to basically look at the results of those inspections in order to somehow gauge how well septic tank systems are performing statewide. We, we say here that's an incremental change. Uh, it's, it's, extremely incremental. It's, uh, it's something, but it's, it's nowhere close to where we need to go. Uh, there have been bills in the past that would have required, made mandatory septic tank inspections every five years, typically. Uh, 
but those either failed or one year it actually passed. And then the, the following year before it could go into effect, the legislature uh, ended it. They did away with that. Uh, another good thing, uh, over the last couple of years, the legislature has provided funding uh, for resilience projects, projects that would address the impacts of coastal flooding uh, in response to sea level rise. And that funding will now hopefully be spent a, a little more wisely and strategically with this bill that created uh, the statewide office of Re resilience. Uh, that's within the, the governor's office and established a, a position of chief resilience officer. So their job will be to help guide how all this resilience funding is spent. There's a lot of it. You'll see that in the next slide. One thing that we need to keep in mind here is that this is responding to the impacts of sea level rise. It, they're basically prohibited from doing anything that addresses the root cause. Uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases. So the state is fairly gung-ho on responding to the impacts, but not doing anything uh, to get at the root cause. I guess you could say it's treating symptoms, but ignoring the actual root of the disease. So this table provides uh, a lot of information. Uh, if we look at the top, I would point to the lines uh, for Florida Forever funding and rural and family lands funding. Those are our uh, two land conservation programs in the state. Florida Forever received $100 million, rural and family lands, $300 million. You're probably all pretty familiar with Florida Forever. That's the program that buys, you know, a lot of our state parks and state forests and uh, other important conservation areas have been acquired through Florida Forever. Rural and family lands is all about protecting agricultural lands that also have some conservation value to them. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the times in terms of uh, having some habitat value and also by pro helping provide some connectivity across the landscape, another uh, real priority for land conservation programs to maintain a linked network. So $400 million total, uh, we're, we're thrilled to have it, but there, there is some important context that I would like to add here. All of that money is from federal funds that were provided to the state uh, to help us address impacts of the pandemic, the economic impacts of the pandemic. Uh, the feds provided a lot of funding to all the states. And in the case of Florida, we, have, we still managed to have a pretty booming economy. So the result was a lot of that federal money uh, wasn't critically needed to, to take care of ordinary everyday needs and, and business of the state. But uh, I guess I just wanna underscore the fact that the state providing $400 million for land conservation, it, it's hard to interpret that as support for land conservation. It's hard to see any kind of uh, sincere uh, agreement with us that uh, land conservation is one of the best things we can do in order to uh, protect our state's resources and, and uh, account for the impacts from all the growth that we're absorbing. We'll touch on that a little more through the course of this presentation. I would jump now uh, to the, the bottom section there. I, I talked about all the money going to resilience projects if you add up those numbers, and it's in excess of half a billion dollars, and that's for this year. Uh, I think we can expect for for the next several years to.
probably see similar levels of funding. So this they're taking seriously. Again, projects that address the impacts of climate change, sea level rise, but uh, nothing that would really get to the root cause of it. And in, in red ink there at the bottom, I guess you could say this was, was too small a number to, to fit in the kind of uh, summary table that you see here, but the state did uh, provide $217,000 uh, to support endangered plant research. That is a, a, a budget line item that it, it's in there every year. We get pretty much 200,000 to maybe a bit more uh, every year. And that always seems to disappear early in the session. And so I like to highlight it because not only is it important to endangered plants, it provides a lot of funding support to organizations like Archbold Biological Station and Bach Tower for the work and research that they do. Uh, but the Florida Native Plant Society is really uh, instrumental every year in getting this money back into the budget and, and helping ensure that it stays there. So uh, that's something that we can look to Sue Mullins for. She's always there. Uh, buzzing in their ears. And when this money goes away, uh, she always finds somebody that sticks it back in. So that was another, another in the good column. Uh, in the bad column, uh, Senate Bill 832 would have required the implementation of some of the recommendations that have put, been put together by the Blue Green Algae Task Force. And if you're not familiar with that, shortly after Governor DeSantis uh, was elected to office uh, very early in his term, and one of his first acts was to establish the Blue Green Algae Task Force. He created another one to look at red tide, but this was coming right on the heels of the serious uh, algae blooms in, in uh, the Caloosahatchee and St. Louis estuaries and elsewhere. And so he established this and, and we were all very uh, optimistic at that point that uh, perhaps we had a governor who was really gonna move the needle on, on the water quality problems that this state has been suffering for years and gets worse by the year. Unfortunately, uh, after almost four years now, the Blue Green Algae Task Force has put together a slate of recommendations. It's, it's composed of some, some pretty good scientists who have been working constantly. Uh, they still meet three or four times a year. Uh, unfortunately, none of those recommendations that they've uh, compiled have been implemented yet. This bill would have really just tackled septic tanks and and required some inspection and made some revisions to the BMAP process, which we'll also talk about a bit more later. Uh, that bill failed to pass. Uh, the Land Acquisition Trust Fund Bill, uh, these are attempts to establish a dedicated funding source for land conservation for Florida forever uh, so that we don't have to come in every year and fight for scraps. And it, it was pretty modest. It would have established a requirement for at least 100 million a year to Florida forever, which is what we got that year, this year from federal funds. But important to keep in mind, historically for more than two decades, land conservation through Preservation 2000 and Florida forever got $300 million a year. Uh, anyway, that bill failed to act. They just will not concede to some level of dedicated funding for land conservation. I don't wanna go into too much detail on these other bills here. I, I'd like to just point out the one on the bottom, golf course best management practices certification. This authorizes IFAS to create and administer a certification program for golf course best management practices. If you're not familiar with that best management practices term, it's their strategies to uh, reduce water pollution. 
And that in itself is not a bad thing. Uh, certainly, I, I don't have a problem with uh, uh, golf course greenskeepers or uh, uh, the, the managers of golf courses uh, to be trained in order to uh, reduce the impacts that their practices have on, on water quality on, as, as a source of pollution. However, that last sentence, certified individuals are exempt from any training requirements and local water and fertilizer ordinances. And there were a couple other bills like this to establish various certifications, and they always seem to include that, which uh, implies to us that really this is not about improving water quality so much as providing a workaround so that uh, it, there's, there's the ability for some of these industries to not have to comply with local fertilizer ordinances. So on, this, on the whole, that not really what we would call a good thing. So now we're to the exceedingly ugly, and this is actually a good news item. Uh, this Senate bill was the one, 2508, was the one that really caused us the most angst during this legislative session. It started out really, really horrible and got less bad as it went along, um, but it did pass, and in its, in its form, it, it would have really had some serious impacts on Everglades restoration. Those were some of the elements that were taken out of it that, that helped it pass. The, the governor expressed his discomfort with this bill specifically because of the impacts to Everglades restoration. But it would also have, uh, you saw that funding formula, $100 million for Florida Forever, $300 million for the Rural and Family Lands Protection Program, which just buys conservation easements over agricultural land. Uh, so, so ultimately, this bill was setting the stage to really transform uh, how we do land conservation in Florida. And in fact, uh, we and many others, I, all, I don't, I can't think of, I can think of one conservation, conservation organization offhand that did not ask the governor to veto this bill. Otherwise, uh, we were all vehemently opposed to it. We all asked for a veto. Uh, just to read through this, Florida's, this was the, the letter that we sent to the governor back in March. Uh, Florida's land conservation programs have long been a model for the entire nation. Senate Bill 2508 threatens to upend our successful approach to land conservation by replacing the science-based, transparent, and accountable Florida Forever program with one that is designed to keep agricultural lands in production rather than to protect sensitive natural resources. You know, we respectfully request that he veto that bill. FNPS has been a champion of the Rural and Family Lands Program since its inception, very true, because productive agricultural lands are a valuable resource and because many of the ranches and forest lands it has protected have supplemental habitat value for native plants and wildlife help maintain connectivity within wildlife corridors and buffer more environmentally sensitive areas. Uh, it goes on to explain that rural and family lands, good as it is, it's no substitute for Florida forever. And so how the exceedingly ugly turned into a good thing was the governor did listen to us and vetoed that bill just, just recently on June 8th and again, you know, we were all speaking with the United Voice. I would like to also share the fact that during the week leading up to this veto, our lobbyist Sue Mullins basically camped out at the governor's office and was needling his staff, pressing them to press him to, to veto this bill. And uh, you know, we believe that, that her efforts were pretty instrumental in pushing him over the line. Uh, with you know, Just a couple of days prior to this, his staff was still convinced that he was gonna sign this bill into law. So the exceedingly bad, whew, we dodged 
a bad one. Again, uh, we won't be shocked if some of uh, the horrible provisions in this bill come back at us next year. So with that, I wanna talk about where we go from here. That was the 2022 session. We have some sense for what's gonna come up in the 2023 session and what some of our biggest concerns are. I bring up here in this slide, the Florida Springs and Aquifer Protection Act. This was passed in 2016, so you might think it's kind of old news. And it required the conservation or restoration of impaired waters. It defined what impaired waters were. It identified 30 springs that it designated as outstanding Florida springs that needed protection. Uh, 24 of those springs were determined to have excess levels of nitrogen. Almost every spring has excess levels of nitrogen now. And it required the development of basin management action plans, what we call BMAPs, by July of 2018. And those BMAPs were required to identify the sources of nitrate pollution, projects and strategies to help remove that pollution or, or ameliorate the impacts. And it also required FDEP to adopt a new rule to address uh, nutrient pollution and to also rest restore uh, reduced flows, especially in springs. So what is a, a BMAP? Uh, because there a, a great number have been adopted now, as, as that last slide showed, there was a deadline and most of these plans have been adopted uh, for nearly four years now, but it's supposed to provide a blueprint for how do we address uh, the pollution problems in individual uh, impaired water bodies. So each BMAP is a blueprint specific to a, a particular watershed or water body. It's supposed to identify strategies. It was developed with some input from lo local stakeholders. And, you know, very importantly, they're adopted by secretarial, secretarial order. So they are enforceable. Uh, there's a, lo a lot of uh, uh, criticism not unfounded, that they are wholly inadequate. We're gonna talk about that. And as I noted, it also required DEP to adopt a new rule. And it's this is really coming to a head now because six years later, there still has not been a new rule. Uh, a draft has been put out for circulation and nobody's happy with it. It's basically the status quo, looks like it wouldn't change a thing. It took them six years to come up with that. So uh, extremely disappointing. And I'm gonna key in on springs, but you know the BMAPs are for impaired water bodies. They're not all springs. Uh, a lot of our rivers have BMAPs for them. Uh, two have been developed for different sections of the St. John's, for example. But just to kind of zero in on what a BMAP should do. Uh, and since so many of them are, are directed at springs, I, I wanna key in on that. So what distinguishes a healthy spring? Well, uh, they have a certain amount of water that discharges from them. Some are bigger than others. First magnitude springs are those that uh, discharge in excess of 100 cubic feet per second. And just to give you a sense for how much water that is, 100 cubic feet per second adds up over the course of a day to almost 65 million gallons. And of course, a lot of those first magnitude springs are way more than that, way more than 100 cubic feet per second, or at least they were. Uh, water quality in springs is distinguished by really high clarity. That's one of the things that they're famous for. Uh, having been here since I, I saw my first Florida spring in 1970, and uh, it, it, I was dumbfounded at how clear that water was. And I, I know they still appear beautiful, but when I look at them now, they look awfully green. They're not the way I remember them. 
And that's in part because they were characterized by very, very low nutrient levels. This was water coming straight out of the Florida and aquifer, pristine, uh, con very constant levels of salinity, dissolved oxygen, and a, a lot of endemic flora and fauna, uh, a lot of submerged aquatic vegetation. That was the uh, base of the food chain for those spring run systems, the, the rivers that it uh, are formed by the spring discharge. We know they serve as warm water refugia for manatees, goes back to that stable year round temperature they're known for. So in the winter time, it's really critical for manatees to find a place where they'll, they'll have some warm water during cold snaps, freezes, and lots of rare and endemic species, silt snails, cave, cave crayfish, a lot of them unique to individual and spring systems. So that's what a healthy spring looks like. And I, I, what I like to think is all those uh, characteristics, criteria, you know, the, the constant flow of water, the, the low nutrient levels, it just creates a very stable system. I, I compiled these for a presentation I gave some time back about spring impacts. And so yeah, that first row in the White Springs bathhouse, that's a 1914 uh, photograph on the left. Uh, that was a major tourist draw. There were hotels that developed around it. Uh, and now you see what it looks like today. There's a, a small stagnant puddle in the bottom. That's a spring that basically just dried up as did the tourist industry that was built around that. Kissingen Springs, uh, those of you from Central Florida might be familiar with that. It's a spring in Polk County. It also was very popular, uh, maybe not with tourists. We didn't really have the same kind of tourist industry, but residents certainly uh, love to go to Kissingen Springs. It wasn't a first magnitude spring, but 30 million gallons a day. So you see a view of that, the before and after. And again, it, it's now just a puddle. And in fact, there are times uh, of year where uh, it will actually swallow water. So it's connected to the Peace River. If the Peace River gets high, water goes up to the spring where it's sucked down <laughs> into the aquifer. Uh, that was one that its, its demise was due to the fertilizer industry. But certainly we see springs all over the state that have been suffering from reduced flows. Uh, the signs of the pollution, the nutrient pollution are everywhere. Here we see, you know, uh, a mermaid in the early days at Wikiwachi Spring. You can see uh, that healthy uh, eelgrass below her and in the, the image to the right. And those images on the bottom are much more typical of what we see in springs nowadays. Either the, that submerged aquatic vegetation has just been completely eliminated, smothered by algae, or we can see it's, it's on track for that in that image in the lower right. So what's causing all this nutrient pollution? These are four uh, pie charts that came out of four different B-maps. Uh, B-maps for the Wikiwachi, Crystal River, Kings Bay, Wakaiva, and Rainbow Springs, spring systems. And this, this tells us the source of the nutrient pollution uh, within each of those respective springs. It's helpful looking across the top at those pie charts, that light green color, that's septic systems. That's a big slice of the pie. We see it's bigger for some than others, but in, for all of those, that's a pretty big slice of the pie. That lighter blue, that's urban turf fertilizer, basically us fertilizing our lawns. Uh, another big slice of the pie in each of those. And they do distinguish farm fertilizer, that's in the orange, sports turf fertilizer. So. 
Uh, that's not us fertilizing our homes. That's fertilizer on playing fields and golf courses and the like. So another significant piece of pie, especially if you add it to the urban turf fertilizer. In the case of those springs, then we see septic tanks and fertilizer uh, as primary sources, really the big pieces of the pie. Rainbow Springs is a bit different. And that one, the light blue is farm fertilizer. I'm having a hard time reading those, those labels myself. But we see here that the, the point I wanted to make is there are a number of spring systems in the state where uh, it's not so much septic systems and the fertilizer that people apply to their, their residential landscapes so much as it's agriculture. And they're especially up in the Panhandle area uh, and certainly in the case of Rainbow Springs. Uh, largely it's agriculture. And I'm not picking on agriculture, uh, but it, it is an important element. And I think that uh, these images here, uh, and this is something kind of hot off the presses, but I think it really reflects the weakness of the B maps. And not in, this, in the case of this one, this is for Rainbow Springs, but there are similar charts within this report that was released by the Florida Springs Council for uh, a large number of the, the spring systems that BMAPs have been developed for. So this is an easier pie chart to read. Uh, the sources of nitrate pollution in Rainbow Springs. Agriculture, 61% of all the nitrogen is from agriculture. So that's the lion's share. The others aren't uh, something that should be ignored. But if you look at where the funding is going, what projects are being funded to benefit Rainbow Springs? We see here $11 million uh, in excess of 11 million for septic tanks, uh, which is, you know, a meaningful but not not the the biggest source of the problem uh what's really more telling is uh in the lower left those those bar charts uh it, it shows the source of nutrient loading and agriculture the the blue indicates that you know that's the lion's share 61 percent the, the red column shows you what we're doing to address those issues in relative terms, spending terms. And you see, we're doing virtually nothing to address the agricultural side of the equation. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we talk, I think I used the term once already, moving the needle. Well, you, you, you see the needle there in the lower right corner. This is what we're accomplishing the needle has hardly budged with what we're doing to benefit uh, Rainbow River. So in, in order to summarize there, and, and this, is, this is the Florida Springs Council looking at all those B maps, all the projects to reduce uh, nutrient pollution. And at the current rate of, uh, addressing our nitrogen overloading, uh, we'll be removing 48,000 pounds of nitrogen a year. And so it'll take us 217 years to get to the point where we have reached uh, the, the goal for nu nutrient reduction. And that ignores the fact that you know, every day, every new development, there's more nitrogen. This is just looking at what current nitrogen loading is. So uh, when we think about what we need to do in order to address the, the nutrient pollution that is you know, devastating our state, honestly, uh, we can't ignore agriculture anymore. Uh, 
it's it's been hands off. The legislature is, seems ready to, you know, nip at the edges on on things like septic tanks, but uh, they're they're not looking to do anything on on the agricultural side of the equation. So that's something we want to push for, consistent with these recommendations that uh, the Florida Springs Council has put up. Uh, we would like to see the Blue Green Algae Task Force's recommendations implemented. As I said, there was a bill to do that this year, at least a small part of those recommendations, it failed. Uh, there are bills every year to preempt local ordinances, including those that address improving water quality. We need to stop doing that. If a local government wants to go further than the legislature, uh, why shouldn't they be allowed to do that? Uh, you know, home rule seems to be something that the legislature is chipping away at uh, very deliberately every legislative session. And believe it or not, the Florida Department of Agriculture does have a model fertilizer ordinance. It's very weak. You might live in one of those communities, a, a city or a county, where uh, a fertilizer ordinance has been adopted. And, uh, you know, uh, contrary to attempts by the state to preempt those so that local governments cannot do it, what we really need is to go in the other direction. And we need the state through FDAX and their model ordinance to provide a model that will really be effective. So that's the water, the water quality side of things. That is going to be, uh, a big priority for us uh, in the in the coming legislative session. This is a priority that uh, may or may not involve the legislature. It's one that we've been working on pretty diligently for a couple of years now. Valerie's helped us out a lot on this. Uh, restoring the Oklawaha River. We we did put together a column in the Sable Miner. I guess it's been a little over a year now to try to quantify uh, the impacts that damming the Oklawaha River have had. And these bullets, 7,500 acres of floodplain forest, they were drowned when that dam was put in, the Rodman Dam. Uh, 150 million gallons a day of, floor, of flow would be restored to the St. Johns River if we breached that dam. So, one way of looking at it is that's how much water is lost to evaporation on that large reservoir that was created by the dam. And that's a minimum. It's expected it, it could very well be considerably more than 150 million gallons a day. Uh, but that would sure benefit the St. John's River as well as the Oklawaha. Uh, the Florida Wildlife Corridor has been a, a, a hot topic lately. The, the legislature has expressed a lot of support for that, uh, provided funding uh, to conserve lands that are specifically within that Florida Wildlife Corridor. And that's what you see in the lighter green color here. Uh, coincidentally, that, that money that they put up for protecting lands in the Florida Wildlife Corridor, also federal money, not state money. Uh, and the dam itself has passed its, its lifespan. This dam was put in place as part of the Cross Florida Barge Canal, built in 1968. It's, it's, it's exceeded its lifespan. A recent uh, dam inspection report uh, was completed uh, for DEP. We, it, it, was, uh, you know, it, it was a real effort to get them to finally release that dam safety report. And when they did, most of it was redacted, so we couldn't read it. But in any case, uh, you know, we've come to the conclusion, and there's more inf information to support this, that the, the most cost-effective strategy would be to remove the dam rather than to repair it and, and restore a free-flowing Oklawaha River. Uh, there have been economic studies done by University of Florida economists that also indicated the recreational values, the, the benefits to the local economies would also uh, go up with restoration. 
So we have been an active uh, partner in the Free the Oklawaha River Coalition. Uh, our contribution has in part included a couple columns that, that we submitted uh, to the Tampa Bay Times. Uh, you see one of those was published here. Uh, and it, it did uh, emphasize the impacts to manatees um, in part because they're, they're starving to death in the Indian River Lagoon because all their seagrasses have died because of all the nutrient pollution and algae blooms. So here we have a, 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 the possibility of by, just by breaching a dam that serves no good purpose uh, to restore 20 springs, spring run systems, uh, places where manatees will be able to eat and stay warm in the winter. Uh, we have sent out action alerts to our members asking you to call the governor to express your support for Oklahoma restoration. And we're really uh, feeling pretty optimistic that something will happen, maybe by executive order from the governor, uh, maybe by legislative action, uh, ideally both. The legislature controls the purse spring, purse string. So there will be a, a need for some funding in order to do this. And the, the funding uh, that the, the coalition is asking for also addresses the impacts that would have on local communities in Putnam County and Marion County. Uh, any local businesses that are dependent on that uh, uh, reservoir, uh, we want to include recreational enhancement so that the local communities will in, in fact uh, realize a lot of benefits, economic benefits from restoration. And one last thing to, to bring up Sue's work for us again, she did bring together the uh, Free the Oklahoma River Coalition and Florida Tax Watch. You may be familiar with who they are. They're a, a pretty conservative organization. They get a lot of respect in Tallahassee. They're all about fiscal responsibility. And we're, we were all so convinced that this project is, uh, it epitomizes fiscal responsibility. Uh, so we thought what we, it would really be great if Tax Watch would look at this and say what they thought. So she put the coalition together with Tax Watch. Uh, shortly thereafter, Tax Watch released a 20 or 30 page report that was uh, very clearly in support of restoration. And we could tell right away that that really had a lot of resonance in the halls of the legislature and, and in the governor's office. So we think that we're really on the cusp of success there. Uh, so uh, that just means keep on pushing in order to make this happen. That will continue to be one of our, our priorities. And uh, hopefully soon, it will not be on our list of priorities because it'll be a done deal and we'll be able to move on to other important things. Uh, this is the other uh, column that uh, I submitted to the uh, Tampa Bay Times. I did have a couple co-authors, uh, one from uh, Florida, the, the Defenders of Wildlife, and the other uh, from the Vice President of the Florida Wildlife Federation. And it focused on the Florida Wildlife Corridor, but I would like to show you that they're, you know, they, they really indulged us. They included a lot of maps and photographs, and a couple of those photos our plants. <laughs> I considered that a, a, a bit of a coup to show that uh, wildlife corridors are also about plants and plant communities and, and their ability to, to move uh, with changing climate. And uh, also a little shout out, uh, that photo of the clasping waria that came from none other than Valerie Anderson. And uh, Shirley Denton contributed the photo of the Florida Bonamia on the, on the second page of that uh, column. You might recall that going back just two or three years, uh, 
we were really uh, neck deep in a battle against M cores, three toll roads, more than 300 miles of road that was proposed by the state. Uh, it came in a, a bill from the Florida legislature that directed Florida Department of Transportation to build these roads. It, it just totally bypassed uh, the state's uh, usual and statutorily defined uh, transportation planning process. Horrible idea. Uh, M cores, uh, I, let me see, the multi use corridors of regional economic significance. Uh, that was the uh, acronym. And we were successful. Again, all the conservation organizations and the residents of the counties that would have been impacted came out in force. Uh, two years after that bill had passed, uh, the legislature relented and Senate Bill 100 was passed, which ended two of those proposed toll roads, but not the third one. The third one that would have extended the, the turnpike northward to U US 19, that remained. And so we are still fighting, uh, I guess you might call it uh, son of MCORs or spawn, evil spawn of MCORs. <laughs> But good news here, uh, there are four proposed alignments. You see them on this map, the, the red, the, the kind of purple, the yellow. It's actually four different alignments, the, a narrow blue one. Uh, so we're fighting all of those. And our strategy there, working with the No Roads to Ruin Coalition that was formed in response to MCORs, uh, includes Sierra Club, Thousand Friends of Florida, a laundry list of conservation organizations. Uh, so we're all still working together. And our strategy here has been to go to local governments and convince them that they don't want anything to do with these roads. Uh, MCORS basically was stopped because the task forces that were created finally came to a conclusion that they couldn't identify a need for any of the roads and they couldn't determine that any of them were financially feasible. So in this case, we're going to these local governments. As we indicate here to this point, Levy County, the cities of Donellan, Inglis, Yankeetown and Inverness, those might not be familiar names to you if you're not from this part of the state, but uh, those are small towns that would have been impacted. and. I should have updated this slide. I said, so might Citrus County on Monday, June 27th. They had a special workshop there to review a, a, a draft, no build resolution that we had provided to them. And indeed they ended up passing a, a stronger no build resolution, resolution unanimously on that day. So we can add Citrus County to that list and next in line, we're gonna work on Sumter County and, and Marion County to see if we can get them to likewise adopt no build resolutions. Uh, there is a report that the Department of Transportation is supposed to provide to the legislature uh, in December of this year, I believe. So we are really pushing to try and get you know, as many local governments as we can that would be impacted by this road to. Uh, adopt no build resolutions and make sure that those are part of the report that goes to the legislature. And hopefully we can uh, kill this once and for all. Uh, a little explanation about this map. Uh, we're the Florida Native Plant Society. So we've come at this issue uh, from the perspective of native plants. And of course, uh, the, the areas you see in dark green on this map are, uh, areas that have been identified as fire dependent natural habitats. You see quite a bit of that. The areas in light green are lands in agriculture that also, at least to some degree, are dependent on using prescribed fire. It, it could be uh, pine plantations or ranch lands. And uh, we also identify conservation lands, those are crosshatched here. 
But the point being, there's an awful lot of fire managed habitat there. We know native plant communities are highly dependent, many of them, on recurring fire. This is the same map, except what I've done is I've superimposed with black dots areas where the Florida Forest Service has issued burn authorizations over the last 10 years. Uh, the, the period of record I, I had, the data I received from the Florida Forest Service was from the, the 10 years from 2010 through 2019, more than 7,000 burn authorizations in a 10 year period. I think a, a, a little quick math shows that's, that's an average of more than one a day, one burn authorization a day over the entire 10 year period. There's a lot of burning going on. It's hard to do burning when you've got high speed highways right next to you. And you can see a lot of those black dots are superimposed on these uh, proposed routes for the highway. And of course, smoke moves, smoke plumes, that's the real danger on a road. So uh, the fire doesn't even have to take place right along the highway in order for the smoke to pose a hazard. And as a result, uh, uh, the managers of those properties are, are very likely to just skip the burn. We've seen that a lot. There have been some pretty tragic consequences on highways, uh, I-75, I-4, and uh, I-95, uh, when prescribed burns have taken place and put dense smoke over those highways. People have died. So this was a major issue to us and it has had some resonance uh, with those local governments. They're actually talking about this now. And uh, we're also online uh, next month to go to the Hernando Citrus MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization. Those are the, the, the local governing bodies where transportation planning should take place. And uh, we have a good sense that they are also gonna pass a resolution uh, opposing these highways. Yippee. And uh, this is another case where, you know, we can almost taste a victory. It's not there yet, but we're starting to feel a little bit confident. The last thing I wanna talk about, uh, I've always wanted to find ways where we could really harness the power of the chapters that we have almost 10,000 members now, over 30 chapters. We often are asked if we could help uh, chapters when they get involved in local land use issues. And, and honestly, we'd love to be able to do that. We just don't have the bandwidth. We don't have, we can't be in you know, that many places at one time. Uh, we're not really familiar more often than not with uh, local land use issues. And we're very supportive of the chapters getting involved in those. Kind of associated with that, one avenue where chapters might really be able to uh, help us as a society be more effective in conserving native plants and native plant communities is by uh, involving ourselves in the development of updated land management plans for public conservation lands. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, the society's involvement in land management reviews. Uh, most of the conservation lands in the state are required to go through these, I think every five years, assemble a team uh, re representative of a lot of different interest groups including a conservation organization, which more often than not is someone from the Florida Native Plant Society. So we are involved in reviewing the effectiveness of land management on these conservation lands. That's been very effective. And we feel the next step is, since most of these management plans have to be updated every 10 years, let's involve ourselves on the front end and really find a way to play a role in what those management plans say needs to be done. A land management review is really just about finding out, are they doing what the management plan says? It's not really 
uh, an assessment of the effectiveness of the land management plan or could things be done better? And so we really see this as the, the next step in our evolution to, to really play a role in how conservation lands are managed. So what, what, what I have here, just uh, to be representative about this, uh, ARC, the Acquisition and Restoration Council, that's a body that advises the Department of Environmental Protection on land conservation projects. They also play a role in reviewing management plan updates. And there are a lot of them. This is a list of just the ones that are going to be reviewed at their October meeting. I have submitted comments on several uh, management plan updates. I know that we've had kind of a, a hit and miss in that we have had members that have been invited to serve on the advisory committees that DEP establishes uh, when they're updating their management plans. But we'd like to do the same uh, when there are some of these other state forests, for example. Uh, but ultimately, we, we cannot be in all these different places. We aren't intimately familiar with all of these properties, but I'll bet in a lot of cases, we have members who are and could really play a constructive role on these advisory committees. So we're trying to figure out a process where uh, we can actually be proactive about getting Florida Native Plant, Plant Society members involved with these advisory committees so that we can uh, really have a voice in how conservation lands will be managed into the future. And so that was my quick run through, uh, maybe not quick enough, but uh, you know, I would welcome questions. If you have comments on what we're doing, if you would like to make suggestions, if, if there's something that we're not doing that you really think we, we, should, really, we, we should rethink what our priorities are, uh, I'd welcome hearing from you about it. If you do not receive our action alerts, if when I mentioned those, it didn't sound familiar to you, but if you don't receive them, but you would like to, uh, I'd also welcome hearing from you about that. And we can make sure that you will be added to the email list and receive those in the future. And with that, you know, I'll, I'll let Valerie determine if there's time for any kind of question and answer. Yes, I have time. So let's have some questions. Um, just for your information, Jean, I put that action alert Google form that I had made, um, was it last year? Okay. Yeah, I put that in the chat so people can um, Great. get in there. Um, let's see, when you're, Greg does have a question, um, Greg Thomas from Heartland Chapter. So back when you were talking about water quality in Springs, he asked, can we push FDEP to do something substantial? Um, Water quality is a central, vital FDEP concern, and certainly within their agency purview. Yes, and you know, uh, we will be lobbying for bills to implement the recommendations of the Blue Green Algae Task Force, and a lot of that would fall on FDEP. Uh, a lot of the organizations we partner with. Uh, you know, we're, we're not litigious at FNPS. We really just don't have the funding or, or the inclination, honestly, to get involved in filing suits. Uh, but there are some of our partner organizations do. I mentioned the Florida Springs Council and they, are, they filed suit uh, together with several other organizations uh, to force DEP to come up with better BMAPs. Uh, those, those slides I showed that indicated just how inadequate the current BMAPs are, that came from the Florida Springs Council. Uh, that's one of the reasons I was using Springs as an example. They are an obvious example of where we're seeing water quality impacts. But again, a lot of those BMAPs that have been adopted are for water bodies or uh, aquatic systems other than springs, but certainly we want to do whatever we can uh, to promote 
some some serious action. It's it just gets worse and worse every year. And uh, you know, we're we're disappointed the governor didn't move forward after he created a blue green algae task force and a task force to look at red tides. And it 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 just feels like nothing has happened. And so uh, it, it's time to put the legislature's feet to the fire and push them to finally do something that will be meaningful. Right. So to clarify your answer, you're, he's asking, you know, make DEP do something, right? Say, make DEP do something. This is what DEP is supposed to do. But DEP is just an agency sort of at the whim of what the legislature and governor have to do. Yes. Yes. Now, I, I mentioned that the that rule that DEP was required to enact as part of the, the Florida Springs and Aquifer Protection Act in 2016, they've just come out with a draft after six years, and, and that's ludicrous. So some of this does fall on, uh, you can call it intransigence within the agency, but ultimately, yes, the point Valerie's making is uh, the agencies do as they're told by the legislature. The laws come from the legislature, the, the laws that serve as the basis for the rules that DEP would enact. So we really have to approach it from both sides. But ultimately, if, if DEP feels they don't have the authority to do something because the legislature hasn't given it to them, we need to press the legislature to, to push more responsibility on DEP and give them the authority, the legal authority to actually get things done. Right. Like, of course, there may be, you know, hiring practices and cultural issues and, you know, bureaucratic processes and administration that aren't directly related to what the governor and legislature are doing. But the governor and legislature, you know, do drive funding and priorities and in some yes. cases hiring. Yeah. And, and as that last session showed us, you know, this problem is facing some serious issues. There were a few minor little things that could have achieved some improvements uh, on the water pollution side of things, but they had much more interest in the culture war issues that, you know, uh, I, I don't know how many of the people tuned into this might, might really be thrilled with some of those things that the, the legislature did, but, you know, it, it could be argued they weren't pressing problems. Uh, if they were problems at all. And the things where we really need to see some action, uh, the, the, that's ignored. And it's, it's beyond frustrating. And it's, it's certainly not serving the people and the natural resources of the state of Florida. Oh, yes. And, um, while we're kind of talking about natural resources, you know, I wanted to talk about we have those land management reviews that that you specified, um, and you know, we're trying to expand into those advisory councils, advisory boards. Yes, advisory committees. Advisory committees, um, but I also get a lot of requests. Well, not a lot, but maybe one a month from the F, from FWC, who also has their own separate form of what's kind of a land management review. Um, and that's not plugged into our existing land management review process. And so what they do, what I've told them to do, is to look, look at the chapter websites and see if there is a conservation chair and to contact them. And if they don't see a conservation chair, contact me and I will find the right person at the chapter to help, to help that. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, make sure that your chapter has a conservation chair <laughs> so that the, so the FWC has somebody to contact when they're looking um, to get their flavor of the land management reviews done in your area. Yeah, we have, we have so many members with expertise, the knowledge that would really be beneficial. And so really harnessing the power of our membership I think would allow the society to achieve so much more. Um, yes, and uh, there's no other questions in the chat. So I did 
want to kind of talk quickly about 1078, the Solon Water Conservation District bill. Yes. And just how awful that bill is. It, it was certainly counterproductive. And I, I think the, the point we were making, if I'd gone into some discussion on that bill, was uh, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, uh, they included people from a variety of uh, interest groups, all different kinds of expertise. And th they, they basically reduced it to people who are in agriculture. And water is a shared resource. And it, it sure didn't make sense uh, I, th I think it's going to diminish the effectiveness of those bodies. And in, in a way, I almost fear it's a first step towards just abolishing them. Uh, and it often said that the best government's the, the government that's closest to the people. So having those districts and, and having a, a more uh, local perspective represented on on how water would be managed in those areas is really important. Uh, and we, we did hear some, some rumblings about what was really behind that. And uh, I don't wanna go into it, but let's just say that in a lot of cases, the, the motivations for these bills come from really narrow, self-serving <laughs> uh, places. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sure wish we had a state government that was more interested in serving all of us rather than the few. But uh, I think that was a bill that epitomizes a, uh, a, an action, a legislative action to serve the few and not all of us. It, it will, in effect, get rid of a number of the water, soil and water conservation districts because the guidance for the qualification process for people to be on these boards did not come out until um, the Wednesday. And qualification for these positions, it requires each position, the board must be full. The board must be full as of this November election, every single board in the state, or it will get dissolved. And <laughs> Okay, so here, difficult parameter, right? Difficult parameter. There are a number of districts in the state that are not full. And then on top of that, elections, you know, the election occurs in November. However, qualifying was on the Friday after that Wednesday. So the guidance came out on Wednesday. The final document was not available in its, in its form with the little notary on the bottom until Thursday at like 3.30 p.m. I wasn't familiar with all that, but it sure sounds like a recipe designed to just dissolve them without saying that's what they're doing. The initial iteration of the bill was literally said the intent is to dissolve the districts. And so this is basically dissolution of the Solon Water Conservation Districts by making it very, very, very difficult to actually have a district. Diabolical. Thanks for sharing that with me. I did not know that. It's, you know, we see these because like every year we've been, I've been coming to these, you know, the policy committee meetings and you watch the legislature, you know, people are like, ha ha ha, you know, it's the, it's the, the most dangerous 60 days to be a Floridian talking about the legislature session. And, you know, we have the good, the bad and the ugly. We have the good bills, we have the bad bills, which are, you know, numerous. And then we have the bills that legislatures introduced that they never go anywhere and so just to see the the these bills with terrible intent make it so far and the good bills don't go anywhere in our state yeah. legislature well i i one of the real take-home lessons i hope from this presentation and i didn't spill it out explicitly enough perhaps is that there were very very few bills that we could call good. And most of them did not pass. They didn't go anywhere. The one to provide a dedicated funding source for Florida Forever, for example, it passed its first committee in the Senate. That was all it did. 
and and we suspect it's because uh, the sponsor was the vice chair of the committee and Linda Stewart from Orlando, and it was a courtesy to her. But they were not going to let that bill go anywhere, sponsored by a Democrat, excuse me, and uh, and and really no actual devout sincere support for land conservation. So good bills that go nowhere, we celebrate bad bills that either don't pass because we work like crazy to keep them from passing or they pass and then we beg the governor, please veto them. And so this year we had some bad, bad bills that we managed to beat back and a couple really bad ones, several really bad ones that the governor vetoed. And that is the state of uh, governing in Florida. <laughs> it's, a, it's abysmal, it's embarrassing, shameful. I, I'm disgusted by it, but you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go out and, and do what we can. <laughs> so we're not bad news bears because we like to be negative. We're not celebrating vetoes because that's the only thing we wanna celebrate. We are in this position because of the state of governance here. Indeed. It's sad when all you can do is celebrate bad bills that don't pass and bad bills that get vetoed. Give us good bills to celebrate, please. And they are filed. You know, when we have a handful of legislators that file moderately good bills or great bills every year. Yes. And most of them are sponsored by Democrats and it's the kiss of death. Uh, you know, we have hopes that we're looking for champions, if you will, legislators that these priorities I'm talking about, uh, restoring the Oklawaha, getting funding to make that happen, a movement on water quality, on getting dedicated funding for Florida forever, we're trying to identify a champion, a state legislator that will sponsor that and be its champion. Uh, and they have to be Republicans. It's so that's where we are. We're trying to find uh, Republican legislators that will be sympathetic to sympathetic and supportive to some of our issues. Maybe help make something happen something we can actually celebrate. Well, uh, lots of people had to hop off because they have to go back to work, but um, I think this has been really, really great, Gene. Well, and uh, we, we may do this a little more often. I, I think I've, I've corresponded with you about maybe at least a couple times a year, get together and do this. And so maybe come November or so, uh, you know, several months before the legislative session starts, but right when uh, the, the committees are starting to meet and when the legislative delegations are starting to schedule their meetings in local communities, uh, we might get to get, the, get together again uh, with a meeting like this, a presentation like this and uh, harness some of that uh, power of the chapters and and uh, you know let our members know how they might be able to help influence things by uh, contacting their local legislators because really they do listen to their constituents well I think we're good um, all right everybody thanks I'll let I'll let everybody know when we're scheduling that one in November. And oh, um, August 5th, I'm gonna do, Tom Hochter had a talk at our 2019 conference. I think it's a really good time to bring it back because he, he, has, he has this whole thing about the toll roads. Because if you remember from the, uh, the panel, the land trust panel, we actually got notification that somebody saw it on Facebook that the governor had signed that bill during the 2019 conference. So yes. I think I'm gonna continue our little retrospective back to when MCORS was signed. And um, so that'll be yeah. August 5th. That's stung. <laughs> That was a veto we requested and didn't get. Hey, yeah. but we have kept on it. Everybody in the state, who cares? We have all been working hard on this. 
persistence. And it, and it has worked. Yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty content with how, how that's been going. We're, we're fighting the good fight and, and we are, we are gaining ground. Thanks again.